that uh, right so so when you log into your uh, the latest version of the, the the global markets version of the TWS you should be able to get this okay so what we are looking for is this look at this uh, we should be able to see somehow these uh, dots are not coming right now but just try and enter an order go mainly we are interested in the stock the underlying stock data and the stock option data okay so take one of your trial accounts and uh, at least what you should get is if you see when I mouse over here it's not giving me the delayed data message it's not even given the green and red buttons right now okay so if we try and do a trade the way to figure out if you're getting delayed data is let's try and do a trade now let's I, I have this I already have this long trade on uh, uh, gold okay so let me try and uh, let's say buy, buy. Uh, this is this is the euro dollar actually it's not gold okay so uh, let's buy another euro dollar okay let's try and buy market and this is getting entered into the globex okay so the order is filled okay so which means that i did not get this message if i get a pop-up okay if i get a pop-up then obviously that would happen if you, if you try to get somewhere where you don't have live data like this one okay here i don't have live data so yeah, now I'm getting the pop-up. So you know how to figure out whether you have live data or delayed data. Okay. Can you see this? Yeah. If you try to order a bar, if you try to enter a market order, it will tell you. It should have given you a. Uh, it should have given you a message saying. Uh, Yeah, we only have the euro dollar trade okay so let's just i mean i think we can already see now if you mouse over you get that message yeah this is what we want we, we this is what we don't want to see okay we don't want to see delayed last available data is displayed another way to text test for this is you try and enter an order and if you have delayed data this proves that i don't have delayed data in the euro dollar because you know the in the euro dollar futures i was able to buy a second contract and i did not get a warning message so if you have delayed data the system will give you a warning message saying that you are trying to enter an order in a market where you don't have live data okay so it will give you that warning pop-up so that's another way to test that you have delayed data so what we don't want is delayed data we want to have live data so all of this stuff and just briefly now you know why why i said this to you that whenever you're talking about the euro dollar fx uh, currency pair why you should always say euro dollar fx because this is another th another contract that is called the euro dollar okay so this is like the uh, based on the this is the interest rate futures contract which is referred to as the three month euro dollar futures contract okay which is a futures contract on three month euro dollar deposits in london so it's an interest rate product it's a totally different asset class but if you just say euro dollar i can't figure out what you're referring to so that's why when you're talking about the euro dollar when your intention is to refer to the <coughs> euro dollar fx uh, the currency exchange rate between the euro and the dollar you have to say euro dollar fx okay and it's even better if you can when you're when you intend to refer to the euro dollar futures contract the one i just traded in okay then you should say euro dollar three month uh, interest rate uh, futures contracts on the three month euro dollar deposits okay or three month uh, three month euro dollar futures if you say three month euro dollar futures people will understand that you're referring to the interest rate futures contract is this clear now you understand the complexity of global markets okay how you have to be very very particular about the use of words okay so the first thing i want you guys to test that at least if we know this for a few con few few cases where people are able to successfully log in okay they should be able to log in and then they should get like when i mouse over here i get delayed data when i mouse over the crude oil contract i'm not getting such a message okay so this is live another way to test it is to try and do a trade if we now go to microsoft some of these stocks that we are intending to trade when i mouse over here also i should get delayed data unless they've already fixed it i was actually getting uh, delayed data when my account is quite old i should not get delayed data messages but when you mouse over like this you should not get delayed data on the cash on the uh, cash equities okay 
this thing and then you also want to do one more thing which is you want to right click here you want to right click here and open the option trader go to trading tools open the option trader so you take Microsoft or any other example and you open the option trader and here too you know where the prices are by now you know where the prices are you can see the bid and ask for calls and puts okay take a you wait for this to load so take a slightly uh, uh, longer maturity and then when you mouse over these when you mouse over these they're still not loaded fully when you mouse over this also here bid and ask bid and ask you should not get delayed data and in your trial accounts and take one of the trial accounts and try and to try and do a trade try and just kick on the uh, bid and ask try and do a trade in the options okay again if you don't have the uh, live options data again it'll give you a warning saying that you're trying to do a trade in a market where you don't have live data so what we want to do is this clear message clear to everybody those who are able to log in on these new sets of accounts you should now perform this test for the particular markets that we are interested in both the underlying and the options okay both the underlying and the options we want to test and see whether the data is live for cases like yours Anjum uh, sort of beware uh, where you are able to log in and now test for live data is this clear do the test okay some people here also are able to log in so do this test so this is our first test so this is clear to everybody let's do that and eventually everybody else also once your accounts go live everyone should perform this test nobody should be left with del left with delayed data here of course you can see all the Greeks are not being calculated these are called the Greeks they're not being calculated because this market is not live we're going to close this and we are going to go to something where the market is open we're going to go to the uh, crude oil, fu crude oil uh, futures options okay so let's uh, right click on this and go to option trade I have that open at least okay so let that load okay so then we go on to our next uh, we go on to our let's get the crude oil chart also and see how it's reacting so apparently this uh, this disruption in Saudi Arabia this is affecting I think this is affecting about three to five million uh, barrels of oil per day and they're saying they're going to be able to bring it back on stream uh, within a month or so but people are in the market are not really uh, sure whether this will come back but interesting the interesting you notice the reaction in the oil market the price was here when the news came and if you take three to five million barrels of oil per day from the market that's quite a big disruption okay but there still isn't enough uh, there's not a very large if you look at if you really want to see uh, from a, a weekly perspective right if you want to look at weekly data can you see how small that is I mean given that there's such a big disruption in one of the world's biggest uh, energy producers okay uh, there you can see that the uh, disruption is not very big at all when you're looking at it from the point of view of uh, the big picture price movement can you see how small it is can you see that the, the, the price movement and the reaction to this kind of a supply disruption is quite small okay so you understand the logic so supply disruption should cause what prices should go up or down when there's a supply disruption like this so prices should go up or down up why right? because if supply is unchanged cetris paribus the uh, demand remains the same prices should go up okay the basic supply demand logic so one of the reasons why people are saying this is not going to uh, one of the reasons is uh, i hope you guys have been following the market commentary this is what you have to learn right when you have events like this uh, you have to follow the market commentary and figure out for yourself what the market is saying as to why the price has not reacted much okay one is that what is that anybody has picked up on any of the points being mentioned no one has picked up so one of the things is uh, a lot of the the US has authorized the release of uh, strategic petroleum reserves every country maintains what is called an SPR strategic petroleum reserve which is in cases of supply disruptions we are also maintaining that I think somewhere in the south the Saudis are helping us to build that we want to build a petroleum reserve because our oil may also be affected if there is a war or some other disruption like this so in fact our supplies also affect so there's something called a strategic petroleum reserve which people keep inventories in stock 
so uh, if there is a disruption they will release that okay so the Saudis have released some of that uh, from their inventories and the US has also authorized the release of that and then plus there is plenty of oil in the market US production is also quite healthy so that's why people are not so worried and then there's also the matter of uh, you know maybe f further perception of weaker demand so these are some of the things that people are saying uh, what they're discussing in the market as to why the prices are because you can clearly see the price reaction is pretty muted it's a pretty limited price reaction right because people were saying this will go to hundred dollars or buy hundred dollars a barrel and all that but that's not happened so this is some of the stuff so this is the kind of stuff that you guys have to pick up on that you have to understand you have to follow markets you have to follow the news see what is happening see how the price is reacting assess for yourself is this a is this what you would expect or maybe you would have expected it to go much higher then what, what are some of the reasons people are saying why this is not gone high, not gone higher and all that so you have this has to go into your brain on a regular basis with not just this event but everything that's going on in the market okay there's another event that has happened in US money markets which is quite significant there's a bit of a funding crunch so US money market rates are going up so the US Fed is actually doing a lot of repos there's some unusual activity normally in US money markets you don't have any unusual activity uh, it's a pretty well it's a liquid market and well regulated but here there's some dispatch in supply demand and so rates are shooting up the Fed is doing lots of repos okay so these things you got to know because from all these events you can actually learn a lot especially at your stage you can learn a lot from all these events about how this uh, how markets function okay because this is the reality that you have to operate in okay so you have to make sure that that's why I keep telling you guys that you have to continuously I can see clearly nobody's monitoring stuff nobody's monitoring the markets enough okay you have to be monitoring or this is your real learning of finance this is the if you do it this way then you can go into your interview you're almost like you've been working for two years on a trading desk so that's what because all the experience of the two years is already embedded in your brain because you were living through all that okay because by you were following it constantly etc so anyway so this is what you should be doing but so we just have a little bit of a discussion on the oil price you can see oil prices are here at least now we can see this is what we were looking for actually maybe it takes a little time to uh, I don't know why this uh, green and red is not coming you notice here that you have these uh, little dots the tick dot that you get these red and green dots that you get here you get a green dot here you get a red dot uh, both are green okay so that's a clear sign that the data is live okay so if you see that okay so here you can start uh, so so we'll, we'll continue with what we were discussing I'm just gonna cancel this Order canceled. okay so let's continue with what we, what we were discussing All right, so the TWS tasks for today, uh, that's done. Okay, next is uh, we continue with our models, okay, with the, the uh, decision problems uh, that we are solving. Okay, so uh, let's look at your spreadsheet, which is already, which is in your folder, which you can access. And we go to the DP4 paradigms, which is, Okay, we would prefer to call this buy sell paradigms. Okay, Garvit, you monitor, make sure that not more than one person goes out at a time. This is a dangerous monitor. <laughs> there, is a, there is an expression, have you heard this expression in the English language? That the wolf is guarding the hen house. Okay, so this is like the wolf guarding the hen house. Why do we need to make it so small? Actually, I don't know why this is. Uh, okay, so what we're going to do is we, we will not worry so much about TA. Can you guys on the last bench, can you read it? You're able to read all this stuff like value agnostic and all you can still read the font. Okay, that's good. Okay, so the reason I showed you this framework essentially is just to first to understand, uh, so it's first to uh, drive home the difference between what we discussed here, which is when we were talking about option valuation models, okay, so which is that the concept of fair value and the concept that value is subjective and that price is objective, okay, and essentially what we, we discussed a little bit about that, okay, so we continue with that here.
so we have to stop actually so if we talk about fair value models okay so what you have to understand that these all these models that you have been uh, that you've already covered in your uh, in your fm1 fm2 okay do you realize uh, we discussed this briefly the other day that you realize the basic structure of these models are all the same right the basic structure is all the same which is basically what we have is if we can just write it down okay so these are what i call forecast based models okay let's call them um, So these are forecast based fair value models. Why am I calling them forecast based? Because I'm going to later on distinguish them against, uh, distinguish them relative to the this other class of models which you are which we are calling arbitrage free valuation models okay this is afv stands for arbitrage free valuation models okay so typically if you'll notice now some of you guys like saloni was saying some couple of the other guys are doing some course which you passed up on who are who's doing those courses Tanya is doing it yeah just give me the outline of the course just give me what the syllabus is okay so you will find typically most of these courses I've studied some of these courses now typically what they do is basically what you'll be doing with DG sir in your corporate finance modeling course okay so this actually gives you a slightly most of these courses are doing this and and they're calling themselves uh, financial modeling courses that actually is not not a correct term because uh, the DG sir DG term is more correct because he's calling it corporate finance modeling which means it's like I if I give you uh, only dosa and sambar and idli and I call it Indian food, that's not correct. I should call it South Indian food, right? That would be more appropriate. So you're only actually doing one type of model, which is basically what is what I am calling this forecast based valuation models. And usually what you're doing is mostly in the case of stocks. Mostly you're applying it to value stocks, if I'm not mistaken from the syllabus, from the syllabi that I've looked at. But the important thing to understand is basically that we call them, I'll explain to you why I call them forecast based. These are focus, forecast based because the other class of models, the AFP models, the AFP models are strictly speaking not based on forecast. These are not based on forecast. So here you have a classification in this uh, value versus price box in this value versus price box you have two subcategories one is the afp models and one is the uh, forecast based valuation models okay all right so uh, this uh, so i have to have now deduct two marks for i have to deduct uh, marks for hardik and tarun because they were obviously sharing some joke so we have to add some vips for today yes okay so the point the the scheme here that you see this is there in your folder you can see this you can access this file you can see the breakup the first breakup we have done at a high level is that you know how do you solve these uh, how do you solve the fundamental buy sell decision problem you can you have two approaches one is you can take the ta approach okay in which case you're not at all concerned with value you're just looking at price patterns and trying to predict and you're doing some price based calculations like moving averages and stuff but you're only concerned with the market price price and price derivatives okay and and other stuff like volume which is all basically market activity but here when you're looking at the other other approach to solving so th these are two different approaches to solving this problem and the other approach is basically where you are going to compare you're going to compute this thing called this special thing called fair value you're going to compute the special thing called fair value and then you're going to compare it to the price and then you're going to take the decision if the price is below the fair value you will buy and if the price is above the fair value in general terms you will be a seller okay but some places like value investing in equities and all typically guy like warren buffett most famous value investor in equities he does not really sell he maintains a long only portfolio he does not go short so if he thinks something is overpriced he won't buy it that's it but he won't sell it he won't go short he won't go net short so but in general uh, this value versus price paradigm is that if it's price is above value you sell it if it's below value you buy it so you understand the basic difference here this concept of value doesn't come in at all and what you have studied in most of the what people study in most basic finance courses is all this kind of form, uh, all these things all this actually fall into this box okay and the important thing to uh, the reason we go through this the reason i'm going through this framework is 
because this you need to understand that all the stuff that you did this bond valuation stock valuation npv why is it relevant okay it is relevant to so because it is one way to solve this buy sell decision problem are you following what i'm saying this basic thing because usually what happens is the valuation thing falls from the sky <coughs> okay we are doing valuation we are doing project for a uh, project valuation but why basically uh, it, it, the reason you are doing it is because it's one way to solve the buy sell decision problem are you following what i'm saying i'm making the connection to a decision problem which is normally not made okay so we'll see this in greater detail later right now i'm under a little bit of pressure to get into your option trading framework because the project needs to start but this is the first thing and the second is within this value versus price comparison paradigm we have further we we have a further classification of those which are based on forecast forecast based valuation and the those which are arbitrage free valuation which is basically not based on forecasts yeah sorry you want to increase the zoo uh, you want to basically increase the magnification a little bit yeah now it's okay yeah because we don't really need to look at the ta details right now all this other sub classification within ta because we are not studying that right now okay ta is a subject by itself you can actually have three courses on ta itself okay there's so much material yes we haven't even done, have in at least in dsb we haven't done even one on ta the first one we know your uh, yeah i have given you some idea about ta okay how to apply a ta based approach but that's a very basic approach it's a solid approach actually but it's a very basic approach and what i have told you to do you can apply it both as a momentum trader and as a mean reversion trader but what i have taught you is actually falls into this essentially it falls into this this box within ta you can have all these classifications so i haven't taught you anything to do with uh, the mechanical trading systems okay i haven't taught you anything to do with that at all uh, but i have only taught you the kind of system that i've taught you like the stuff like the uh, the the high low the basic definition of a trend okay and buying with new highs etc that really falls into and i've told you to apply it on multiple time frames okay you look at the big picture trend and the small picture trend etc okay i mean the small uh, the the micro trends so that's actually a, a that's an approach which falls somewhere here basically that idea comes from dow theory okay so what i've taught you really falls within this so what i've taught you in ta is also a very small subset of everything you can do within ta okay but that's a valid whatever you've covered is very useful in the real world okay you can use it to uh, manage risk if you follow the rules properly okay so we are now in this box so we are not so concerned with ta we are in this box okay and what we are saying is that these are forecast based val uh, fair value models and then there's another class of fair value models which is the arbitrage af stands for arbitrage free valuation and uh, we can just put these notes here that fbv is uh, so we we don't need to write this and slow down i mean that's the whole point of doing the video is that you know i can save a lot of time because i don't have to write down all this stuff okay so this afv stands for arbitrage free valuation this stands for forecast based valuation so the implication is that this is not based on forecasts so we'll come to these details later but you should understand when you're doing these courses that typically you're doing only one class of models there are many other types of models typically you will not cover arbitrage free valuation models okay so it's like you're eating south indian food and people have told you it's indian food and you all you are eating is upma and uh, you know that uttapam and <laughs> dosa and idlis that's all you are eating okay so now we have to understand now, the other thing the last thing i would mention when you are going to be doing this course with dg sir is please understand that these forecast based valuation models they are all based on the same uh, basically we are talking about npv gordon growth model okay etc okay all this stuff bond valuation okay so basically the structure of the steps are basically if you look at the steps they have the same structure same basic structure so if you are doing a forecast based fair value model it has the same basic structure which is we will just write this down so that you are clear which is what is the first step you forecast the periodic returns okay 
Yes, clear? You remember why I use the word returns? I don't want to use specific terms like dividends or uh, interest coupon payments because those will tie us into equities and bonds. I want to use a general expression like returns. So under returns, everything is covered. Bond coupon payment is also a return. Dividend from a stock is also a return. Cash flow from a project is also a return. Everything is covered under returns. So if I say returns, it's a general expression which covers all kinds of uh, returns generated by any asset. So we want to use general. So the first step is you forecast the periodic returns. You're all familiar with this. If you're doing a project, you're forecasting the period returns. Okay. The second step is basically uh, discount. Discount the periodic returns. Okay. So obviously, or let's make it even more. Uh, discount and PV okay so PV means you find the present value of those periodic so a seven year return obviously you will do one plus R to the power seven okay and so on and so forth okay so nth year return so that when I say discount and PV the returns it includes all this that you seventh year you discount one plus, one plus R to the power seven ninth year is one plus R to the power nine and this manner this is clear everyone is following Second step is this, discount and PV, the, uh, the periodic returns. We can make it. Is this clear? Second step is clear. Discount and PV, the periodic returns. The same, it's very simple actually. We not need not even have written it. But since I found some, I mean, I just want to make sure that basics are clear for everybody. And then add, add the PVs. Is this clear? So, you know, so our one of our previous prime ministers used to be uh, very big on uh, this project analysis because his name was PV Narsimha Rao, right? So that's why, okay. So then you add the PVs. Is this clear? Chuk, is, Chuk got the joke before I even, which obviously nobody else found it funny, but Chuk understood the joke before, Chuk understood the joke before it was even cracked. Okay. So is this clear? Yes. Clear now? Okay, so this is a very simple structure. But the point is maybe you're wondering why are we spending time on such basic stuff? Because I just want to make sure that you understand that this is all the same. You may have done bond valuation separately. You may have done uh, uh, a stock valuation separately. Then you've done your project separately. But you have to understand that these are actually all the same. Okay, so later on we'll do some further analysis uh, on uh, these. I'm going to spend more time, a lot more time, on a basic definition of models and stuff like that. How do you cons what is how do you define a model? Okay, what are the various types of models, the taxonomy of models? So we'll spend more time on that right now. I just wanted to just introduce the idea of fair value and the concept of forecast-based fair value models. So you should understand that this kind of landscape exists. There's another category of models which I've not put here, which is your actually I'm going to add that to the framework later which is your regression models so slightly different from the forecast based models okay because they're not really fair value models they're based on slightly different assumptions and then you have in economics you might have heard about general equilibrium models which are based on simultaneous equation systems you know simultaneous equations what you've never done simultaneous equation systems simultaneous equations in mathematics you never did Okay, I don't know what's happening nowadays in school, but I don't know. Anyway, so uh, so you have the point to be aware of is that the when you when you do a course like financial modeling and actually what you're doing is only this, you should be aware that there are many other types of modeling. Okay, so the uh, the universe of models in finance and economics is very wide. Okay, it's a it's a very broad universe. There are many types of models, and when you're looking at something like uh, uh, say option pricing models they actually fall under the arbitrage the AFV category but within AFV also there are two subcategories these are not proper AFV models okay these are improper AFV models and then there are proper AFV models so we'll do the entire classification later but you have to be aware that uh, you should be aware that the, the universal models is quite vast and you need to have a good definition of what is a model okay and uh, what is the what is the tax you need to have a good taxonomy of models you need to understand all the different types of models that exist okay so okay now uh, we go back to now let's go back to this uh, i think we have this idea and then the other thing that i wanted to just drive home is the fact that these are all the same okay all all uh, these forecast based valuation models have the same structure okay we'll come back and deal with later on why uh, 
does anyone know what is the difference mathematically between a project you know the irr of a project have you done the irr of a project uh, you've also done the ytm of a bond okay so mathematically what is the difference between these two if we take a project and we take the irr of a project and if we write down we can write this as homework or something we can write this query project okay we write it in you can think about this question we'll address it later okay when i come back and continue with the uh, the module on models okay we'll continue with that now we'll come back to the options module because i am concerned i have to get you guys ready for the project okay so we are exiting from our discussion of models by leaving you with one question which you can think about is what is the mathematical difference between the bond ytm and the project irr okay uh so you can think about that we'll come back to that and then we leave this now we go back to our uh, option discussion okay um all right so we have uh, this we want to talk about yeah so the correct term is actually uh, the 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 whole discussion on models started because although something like this would be referred to in the industry as the option pricing model i'm just coming to you it is actually a option valuation model this is actually a category of fair value model this is actually a fair value model okay so here what you see here these are all uh, these are both fair value models okay so whenever you're doing a value versus price comparison based analysis you're working with a fair value model then it either might be a forecast based fair fair value model or it might be a afv model okay so the option actually an afv itself has two categories so the option actually falls over here okay uh, it's supposed to be it's, it's a fair value model it's not actually a uh, it's a valuation model it's not a pricing model okay pricing is something that is done by the market yes Gulati, what is the question? Sir, uh, you gave us a homework regarding project uh, IRR and bond uh, ITM. Yeah. So, I mean, we wanted to uh, get uh, wanted uh, want to know the uh, mathematical difference. So, is it regarding the formulation or something? No, mathematical difference. Mathematics is only always formulas. and mathematical expressions you can't do mathematics in words you know like i went to the market you can't do that's not mathematics so no, mathematics always has to be with formulas expressions that is what i'm saying mathematical you think about the formula aspect is this clear is my point clear okay all right so that's the point that we were making when we came here okay so we want to now go on to right so okay my sister okay so before we come to uh, now let's just let's do the decision problems now okay so you guys are already familiar we've covered the uh, the question on the aspects uh, aspects of an option contract we've done this question we've done this part right we can make it uh, 14 we already did aspects of an option contract now let's go back to the decision problems where we've already we are already familiar with the historical decision problems uh, uh by the way just let me mention one thing i noticed while correcting the papers many of you are very carelessly using this is why i emphasize using uh, i mean this is not the only category of error that i found okay uh because most people have failed to uh, factor in the uh, exit price in the calculation of the position uh, position size that if you are trading dollar swiss and your pnl is being generated in swiss francs okay you can't take a swiss franc pnl and compare it compare it with a dollar uh, risk capital a dollar risk per trade so that comparison that needs to be preceded by a way to convert the swiss franc amount into a dollar amount by dividing it with the exit price dividing it by the exit price because that converts the that is the value of the dollar swiss that is the dollar swiss exchange rate at the time that you realize the loss so therefore it has to be converted the swiss loss has to be converted into a dollar loss by using the dollar swiss exchange rate okay so some of you have done it but very few have done it 
many of you have most of you have made these kinds of mistakes so that's one category of mistake the other category of mistake i noticed is even when people are discussing a dollar swiss problem i've asked them for the amount for the position size in a dollar swiss trade and people are writing number of shares why are you writing number of shares it's not number of shares it's the amount of dollars that you are going to buy okay so why people are just mechanically i've seen this in many cases uh, people are just writing number of shares this is because you are not thinking about what you are writing and in in uh, i've noticed at least in this country where people are whenever they talk about financial market they always say stock market shares stock market shares everywhere you know but that's not correct because as i've told you as i've shown you there are many important markets okay many asset classes so uh, you have to get out of these you should not be making these kinds of mistakes when i'm talking when i'm asking you for a dollar swiss amount a dollar amount why should you write number of shares is the amount of dollars right okay so decision problems let's go back to decision we are already familiar with these decision problems okay now in the case of um, options okay in the case of options we have some extra decision problems remember when we were talking about if i'm trading oil if i'm trading just oil futures okay i just need to worry about whether i should buy or sell okay and uh, whether i at what price then where should i enter at the current market price okay or should i enter a, a, at a more favorable price or a less favorable price using a stop order like a donkey and trading system etc okay but if i'm trading oil options do i have some additional decision problems is my question clear because see if i'm trading all futures okay let's say that on this buy sell uh, question i decide that uh, this is uh, i look at this big picture pattern and then i move into a, a smaller view which is here let's say on 4 hours i fall i look into a smaller view and i say let's say for whatever reason i i come to the conclusion that uh, this if the price is not reacting to this kind of a, a bad news event then the market must be really bearish okay so i want to go short at the market okay so there is an uptrend there is an uptrend yeah but you could also look at this and say i'm just saying i'm not going into the uh, details of whether my decision is correct or not i could also look at this and say this is a high this is a low high low this low is lower than this low so there is a downtrend i could also say that this low is actually lower than this low that is before the strike mm -hmm. before the oil strike on oil mm -hmm. that was before the strike on oil yeah 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 before the strike on oil strike yeah yeah you can say that you can do whatever so if uh, chug is more comfortable buying we can buy no problem we will uh just say let's say uh, the point i'm trying to emphasize is this okay so let's say we we take chug's analysis and we decide to buy okay because we think this is going to cause a major supply disruption and uh, the saudis will not be able to bring it back on time in one month okay and there may be there some more attacks coming okay because apparently what they discovered is because there's a you know there's a civil war going on in yemen right you following all this news there's a civil war going on in yemen mm -hmm. because uh, again the UN, yemeni government is actually so so in this whole shia sunni conflict in the middle east okay so the iran is a shiite state most of the others are sunni state at least the rulers are sunni so saudi egypt uh, emirates these are all sunni states even yemen was ruled by a sunni ruler, ruler but there's a ma major civil war these houthi rebels are being backed by iran okay and so there's a civil war going on in yemen which is to the south of saudi so they've been firing missiles earlier so what they the, the saudis had uh, pretty good air defenses they had a lot of uh, patriot us patriot missiles but they were all pointing south because yemen is to the south but iran is to the north not northwest of saudi so uh, the missiles came from these cruise missiles which attacked the oil fields they came from the north so they were not prepared they never thought that iran would actually launch attacks against the saudi oil fields 
so they didn't have the patriot missiles were all pointing south so i believe they have fixed that now so these are uh, so the point is that you could always say that there could be some more attacks maybe they'll launch a stroma a swarm of drones etc which uh, which will penetrate the defenses so anyway so uh, chuk wants to buy so let's buy at 5860 i'm buying oil okay i'm buying oil futures and i'm putting a stop here okay let's say at 54 or whatever so we are buying at 5860 putting a stop at 54 so we've solved our buy sell decision problem right now my point is that if we were trading in oil options instead of trading in oil as an underlying okay in this uh, or oil futures or spot oil we want to now trade in oil future uh, oil options futures options let's say okay or just let's forget about the futures options let's talk about oil options then do we have some my point is do we have some additional decision problems to make i mean additional additional decision problems to solve do we have some additional problems based on what you studied and aspects of an option contract do we have some additional problems what are the additional problems yeah so what i'm saying is extra decision problem in the case of options what tanya has mentioned one point she is talking about expiry because as you can see here in this thing how many are we talking about we can have all these other expiries okay I can have September 2020. Okay. I can have I can change the expiries. You can see all these diff different options that are available. Uh, we have. Okay. So we can make March 20. Okay. So can you see already in this view itself there are two expiries shown? Then you can actually have many many more expiries if you look at something like this. If you look at SP SPY. So the first point that uh, Tanya has mentioned correctly is that it is not sufficient to just say I'm going to buy oil, or I'm going to buy, uh, or I'm going, or I'm going to sell oil. Okay, that we do, uh, that what we've been doing earlier, which we just did in this exercise, that solves the problem. If you are trading in spot oil or oil futures, okay, oil futures also actually you need to take a, uh, a active contract decision. But let's assume that it's a spot oil. Uh, we are doing spot oil trading okay so we don't have the additional complication of futures so in the case of spot oil we just buy and that's good enough okay but in the case of options that's not good enough because there are many different expiries okay as you can see here by clicking these are all the possible expiries okay all these possible expiries are there in the case of oil options okay futures options so now the question is you have so therefore you have to decide the expiry okay this is clear are you following what i'm getting at if I go to options, this is what 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 market, this is the spider. Okay, this is the uh, SPY ETF. So here also you can see. I would like to go to straddle view. The straddle view is when you show the puts and calls uh, side by side. Uh, here. Okay, this kind of view is called a straddle view in the case of options. Okay, it comes from a strategy called a straddle, which we'll do later. Hopefully, we'll have time. Here also, you can see that if you want to trade in SPY options, what is the market saying? What is the uh, software asking you to enter? It wants to know which expiry date do you want me to display the option prices for? Okay, because each display, this is for September 20th. Okay, this is for September 20th. So this is too small, uh, very short term for us. We don't want this. We want to change it. You'll notice the prices will change. Okay, uh, this will update and then the prices will change. So now you're looking at options for 25th October. So the point to understand is that there's expiry is a decision that has to be taken. Okay, that's one. Okay, what else? Strike price is also another decision, very good, because even when I have fixed the expiry, let's say I want to trade for uh, the uh, 180 day options, a six, to six month option. Even when I'm looking only at six month options, I have a whole bunch of strikes. When I'm saying buy an option, okay, let's say we take the uh, corresponding view from the spot market decision. Spot market decision, Joke told us we should buy. So that decision is solved now. That decision problem is solved. So if we transfer that to the option market decision, now we see uh, to the option market. Now we see that just to say that buy an option, 
is not good enough because we need to know which expiry are we going to buy options for because there are different expiries okay we also when we look at a particular expiry we see that oh my god there are so many strikes so which one should i buy okay which strike so strike price is another decision okay now what else quantity okay quantity we already have listed as a separate decision problem we are now just talking about yeah one minute one minute let me just uh, talk about the let me highlight the problems okay in buy sell there are like extra decision problems so entry price is one level problem this exit price with loss exit price with profit number of units is a decision problem okay actually number of units also as you discover towards the end of your previous course there are actually uh, two different types of broad problems to be solved initial position size and the pyramiding pyramiding decisions okay pyramiding positions when you have a second category of decisions when some of the positions may be in profit some may be in a loss okay how to adjust the position size so basically essentially what you have is when you have some all positions all previous positions are in a profit okay then the decision is uh, the way to solve it is exactly the same as the initial one because you just take the total risk capital per trade total risk per trade and you then figure out how much how many units you can buy okay or sell because uh, the you are not when all the previous units are in profit okay you you will not adjust the profit against the uh, risk capital allocation for a trade okay so pyramiding we have we can just put it as two uh, two subclasses of decisions where we could just to make it distinct although essentially it is of so even within pyramiding you have two subclasses of decision problem decisions okay uh, one where all the previous positions are profitable and one where some are not profitable but some are profitable okay so so uh, the, uh, against the the latest stop loss that is going to be used so within uh, posi uh, position size also you have actually got two decisions two types of decisions so we've seen that as well now we are talking about options and we are going back to the buy sell decision and we are saying that it is not sufficient to just say i want to buy an option i want to sell an option you have to sp uh, specify the expiry date you also have to specify within the expiry date you have to specify which strike right is this clear are you following everyone following how the decision problems are increasing in the case of options okay because options are more complicated as an instrument ideally what we would do is actually this year they have shifted fdrm as to the second course so typically we do ifm second and then we can cover futures and forwards and swaps and all that and then we typically prefer to cover options last but since it's come here now uh, because options are the most complex type of instrument but since it's come here to the second course now so we have to just do it here so you have to cover you have to understand options so so many strike prices you have to decide which strike you want to buy, buy okay so remember our decision from the spot market is to buy an option okay so now we have fixed the expiry date 180 days option and on the strike let's say we decide what is the actual uh, right now the price is around 59 so let's say we choose an at the money strike we choose 59 okay is there any other decision that we have to take yes, sir. Call or put, right? You can see I was giving you a hint by doing this call put. Okay, this <laughs> is so like that. Ajit when he is giving his signal, na, tumara signal hoga on off, or uh, uh, your signal will be off on. So <laughs> we are giving you that call put, right? So uh, anyway, so that uh, this call or put, I was giving you a signal here. So call or put also has to be decided, right? It is not so. Yeah. Is it call and put decided along with the decision of buying? The, okay so that's a good point that's a good point actually that uh, this uh, call and put will be decided also whether you're based on your view so you are actually leading us to the whole decision making matrix in the case of options okay but you're right but at the moment we'll just address it as a superficial level that since we have decided to buy since we have decided to buy okay uh, at this level also the uh, the the listing of the decision problems is fine okay that you still need to decide whether if you are going to, given that you want to buy an option 
you still need to decide whether you want to be uh, whether you want to buy a call or a put okay so this is another decision that you have to make call or put one minute tarun i'm just coming to you so call or put also has to be decided okay yes tarun what is your question so buy and sell doesn't determine the uh, price that is call or put but is it an entry price the clients call it for no better one minute i'm not able to follow what you're saying what are you saying the buy and sell refers to only whether we should uh, go into the market or not we should go uh, long or short okay this is what is buying sell yeah whereas the price is defined by the entry price and the exit price okay uh, so call and put here is defining the price or the position to go long or short no uh, more like the second part that what you mentioned actually what you mentioned is your your correct that the price will we are still not talking about the price here because the price is again going to take us to our old decision problem of entry price should i enter when i see i am looking at a bunch of option prices here suppose i decide to buy the 59 calls suppose i decide to buy the 59 calls they are trading at 401 410 okay now i can decide now this is the market price for me if i want to buy okay i can decide to buy at 410 or i can which means case i place a market order or i can decide to buy at with a limit order at a price less favorable and uh, more favorable than the current market so i may place a limit order to buy this option the 59 call uh for a month march april 2020 okay i can buy the, i can place a limit order to buy the right price now is 409 okay i can place place a limit order to buy this at maybe 390 3.9 it's 4.09 right now i want i'm not happy to pay for i'm not willing to pay 4.09 for this call option but i'm happy to buy this call option at 3.9 so i can place a limit order to buy this call option at 3.9 that would be a limit order or if i want to use uh, you know a donkian style uh, trading methodology with respect to option prices okay then uh, which is very unusual actually that is used typically with futures or spot etc so uh, but you could still technically do it if you have been plotting the price of this option you have all the four week highs okay and if you feel the four week high will be broken at say 425 you can place a stop buy order for this call option at 425 4.25 which is that would make you enter the position at a price less favorable than the current market price so that would be via a stop order are you following so is this response uh, that i gave you to your question does it answer your your problem does it address your problem actually i was asking uh, use the mic if you can use the mic let's have Yeah. So what actually I was asking is, uh, how is it related to uh, buy? Is it related to buy or sell, or is it related to exit and entry? Uh, like price, it is related to price or to the position. You know, at this point, you don't worry about price because what am I doing here? If you notice this uh, part here, what am I doing? We have gone back to, we went back to our original list of decision problems, mm -hmm. okay, which we had already identified earlier. If we make it a little smaller to capture everything, we we went back to our original list of decision problems, which is anyway by this is in anyway in your notes, okay? This is in your version of the notes, the outline notes. So then we are trying to introduce this idea that. when you start talking about options it is no longer sufficient to just have those particular decision problems that we had identified earlier there are going to be some additional decision problems that have to be solved when you are trading in options okay and those we are introducing you notice i'm putting this extra dp under options 1 2 and 3 i'm putting it under the buy sell uh, uh, under the buy sell uh, decision so these are like sub decision problems you can say in the case which only arise in the case of options okay well technically under futures also you have an expiration decision which we'll come to later but we'll just uh, so i won't make that second strong statement that we it only arises in the case of options because expiry will arise in the case of futures also okay but uh, these three problems certainly exist in the case of options that when you have decided to buy you have to also decide to the, the expiry date 
the of the option because there are many different expiries trading you have to decide to strike price you have to decide whether it's a call or put that you want to buy okay is this clear does it solve your problem now now the point that tanya has raised is an important point that will bring us to the option decision making framework okay which we may come to at a little bit uh, a little bit later but this is one thing that we have understood now that in the case of options you have three additional decision problems okay so let's now talk briefly a little bit about some of the other aspects we can go back and increase the zoom a little bit yeah okay so the next type point point that we are discussing is something called moneyness of options you can find this in some of the links the cboe link is a good link actually if uh, we go back to so we solved the problem of decision problems the next topic we are talking about is moneyness of options uh decision problems we have already discussed okay then um forecast based valuation model is our first topic for today which we continued okay then we have decision problems which we discussed on the next topic we are discussing is something called moneyness of options just very simple stuff we'll just go through it briefly then you can revise it from your cboe all these websites you can explore these are good websites what we have at the top i i think here i give you all the links these are all good websites again remember don't go here and there investopedia and here there look around on the web uh, follow the links that i'm giving you these are uh, certified links these are good quality links okay so cboe options education here you will find good information there's an options quiz also i think under options education you can take that quiz uh, okay so th these are all the sites you can go to cboe options education find out what uh, about all this so the topic that we are covering is simply this you can just read this we'll find this chart also in the i think in one of those links okay so in this case essentially we have first let's decide one thing which is let's define uh, intrinsic value and time value this is also actually from um, so we talk about uh, moneyness of options within that we are covering this other topic which is option intrinsic value and time value okay so now if you look at see see uh, does any is anyone familiar with these terms what are the what do these term means terms mean okay so essentially intrinsic value essentially is nothing but this you can see this you will find this chart in the options uh, education website okay on the cboc so intrinsic so we are defi defining we are essentially saying that the value of every option consists of two parts the intrinsic value and the time value okay this is one of the reasons why uh, even in the case of american options okay even though american options can technically be exercised early okay most of the time early exercise is not optimal because if you exercise early you will be giving up the time value there are certain exceptions like in the case of uh, you know american style options on non dividend paying stock where there's a long period left to maturity and interest rates are very high so some specialized situations but in general we don't exercise early okay we sell the option because if you exercise early you lose out on the time value okay if you exercise you basically capture just the intrinsic value so intrinsic value you can see what it is very simple the current now again they have not defined it correctly this is this should have been the asset price because they have defined it only for stocks it's actually the same for any asset options on any asset so this stock should be read as current asset price okay so basically you can say iv if you write this this down in iv is intrinsic value iv is basically um, current let's put it as current underlying price okay and you can just take the absolute value of this um, strike price okay so if you write so this is the intrinsic value okay basically the difference between the underlying price and the strike price okay so in this case you can see uh, typically you would say that if you have an option here uh, if you have um, 
the so intrinsic value we don't say that the intrinsic value is, is actually the if you say intrinsic value is uh, we don't say it's negative okay because the option value will not reflect the negative part it will reflect so we either take it as zero or or positive okay essentially it should be either zero or positive okay the point i'm trying to emphasize here we normally don't take because we are talking about the value of option the value of option will not go negative okay so essentially it's either zero or positive okay so if it is negative we say essentially for all practical purposes is zero essentially okay because uh, th this with this say if you look at the underlying right now it's around 59 okay if we add okay so if we take the 69 a 61 strike now the underlying is around 59 so this 61 strike okay if you look at the 61 strike call okay if you look at the 61 strike call this is basically what is the intrinsic value here essentially the intrinsic value of this call is zero okay we we won't say it's negative okay because essentially what you do is in, in intrinsic value you begin you what you do is in order to find out to find iv okay to find iv ask what money you can make by exercising the option now okay okay, okay so ask what money you can make by exercising the option now this is what we, this is what you need to remember by for for our intrinsic value okay so what can I, if I exercise this option now how much money can I make okay and we only say basically we only think of it as zero or positive okay because nobody is going to exercise an option and make a loss to make a loss nobody is going to exercise an option okay so therefore uh, what we say here if you look at the 61 call so let's practice intrinsic value here to understand the concept the underlying is at 59 okay the 61 call if you exercise the 61 call what does it give you the right to do to buy the underlying at at 61 so the 61 calls gives you the right to buy the underlying at 61 now why would you exercise the call to buy at 61 because the market is 59 if the market is 59 why would you buy it at 61 if you buy it at 61 and exercise the option you will make a loss right so in this case we say this option has no intrinsic value okay so this is basically should be said understood as essentially what profit can you make by exercising the option and if it's negative we say we just treat it as zero it, because we if we want to say that the value of an option is equal to mathematically we want to say is equal to the iv plus the time value so in that case we don't write for the value of an option will not go negative so we don't write the option therefore in that expression we don't write iv of negative we don't write a negative iv so for iv essentially what we are trying to think about is what money can i make if i immediately buy this option and immediately exercise this option you understand everyone knows what option exercise is is everyone clear yes sg1 Ex ex exercise of options you know okay everyone is clear about exercise of options so if i exercise the 61 call that means i'll buy uh, first i'll buy the call then i'll exercise the call so i'll buy the call first by paying this money 332 and then i will exercise my right which will give which will enable me to buy the underlying at at 61 but then I'll have to, when I go through this exercise, I want to imagine that I also sell it off in the market. I don't have a position at the end of the exercise. So I buy some, buy the underlying at 61 and immediately I sell it off at 59. Yes, so I make a loss. So therefore here I consider for the option formula part, that option value is equal to IV plus time value. There we write the IV as zero. We don't write a negative IV. So this we treat as I, this option has only time value. An out of the money option essentially has only time value. This is clear because we are saying the value of an option is equal to uh, IV intrinsic value plus time value. This is clear. So when the intrinsic value we find is, is actually negative, we say this option has no intrinsic value, okay, and it has only time value. So here we know one thing that 
because you can see the option has many days to expiration so although this option has no this is something interesting to look at when you look at the prices of out of the money options okay so essentially options that have no intrinsic value they are called uh, basically where they have negative intrinsic value if you calculate if you actually did the exercise you would lose money okay those options are called out of the money options okay those are out of the money options so if i if you look at out of the money options this is useful like the 61 call right now is out of the money is everyone clear so essentially those options where if you exercise if you buy the option and immediately exercise it you will incur a loss in those options we say those options are out of the money is this clear you would incur an actual loss a negative okay so all these things you can uh, you, you will also be able to read from these links options education the very good website okay so is this first, first point clear we have defined what is intrinsic value you know how to calculate intrinsic value basically you ask yourself if i buy the option right now and immediately exercise the option then what uh, amount of profit or loss will I make? If you make an actual loss of some positive amount of loss, I mean, in the sense that the absolute value of the loss is positive, okay? So you make some loss. It's not like a zero. It's not like what we call NPNL, which is no profit, no loss. It's not a break even. It's it's actually a loss, okay? It's some, some magnitude of loss. So if you make that, we basically treat the IV as zero. And that's that kind of option we call an out of the money option. The logic is also quite clear. You're not going to make money by exercising that option, so it's out of the money. Okay, all right. So when you look at out of the money options, you can see also one interesting thing about options. This 61 call should have no value then. Strictly speaking, the 61 call, and if you know these are all real market prices, the 61 call should have no value because by exercising it, nobody makes any money, right? Logically, but the reason this has value, this is called time value. Because this option has 180 days, six months approximately to maturity. So in six months time, all kinds of stuff can happen in the oil market. The oil price can shoot up to 100. Okay. So then the 61 call will have value if the underlying shoots up to 100. And if you buy it now, okay, you will still be holding on to it because you have a six month. If you buy it now, you have a six month call struck at 100 we say it's struck at 100 the strike price uh, sorry not 100 struck at 61 basically the strike price is 61 you have a uh, you have a six month call in your hands which you're holding on to with a strike price of 61 gives you the right to buy the underlying at 61 now if suddenly some more attacks come or some other disruption happens and the oil price shoots up to 100 now you can make a lot of money right so this time value essentially reflects that risk that's why you can't buy this six month option for free, even though you can't actually make any money uh, exercising the option right now. It's out of the money. The out of the money option has value because of time value. Because this is the time, this entire uh, three month, the same thing if you look at, okay, if you look at the same thing for a 147 day option, let's do the same exercise. So everyone follows 330 is what I have to pay if I want to buy a 61 call for six months. Okay. Now, if I look at the same 61 call, if I go to 147 days, I thought I just clicked on 144, 147 days. And somehow it's not responding. No, it's not uh, for some reason. There's a little bit of a corruption in the display also. But anyway, Feb 20, March 20, if I take Feb 20, March 20. So this system seems to be hanging because it's not really responding this updating but anyway the point is that you will see that if you if you look at the same out of the money option okay if you now we're looking at a 180 day price if you look if you reduce the time period the time value will increase or decrease it will decrease right 
because the time is now less for it to go to hundred dollars and do all kinds of funny stuff like that the whole time period is much less okay so the chances of uh, happening is ch that happening is less so in general your time period will when you reduce the time period the time value will reduce so then so you've learned a few things now you learned the concept of intrinsic value how to figure out intrinsic value and what do we mean by out of the money options that those which have te technically a negative intrinsic value where you would actually make a loss by exercising it so there we say those are out of the money options okay and then we can now use this concept and then you can also see that out of the money options have time value and the reason they have time value is because those options give you some kind of an insurance policy okay that the price may suddenly move in your favor okay the underlying price so therefore you would uh, there you still have a chance to make a profit that's why you don't get to buy it for free okay so there you have out of the money now can we also define quickly now therefore what does add the money mean if out of the money is one where you would actually make a loss by exercising the option, buying it and exercising, then what is add the money? No profit, no loss. Okay. If you make it so here, if we say, if we round it off and say that the underlying is at 59, here the add the money would be here. Okay. So add the money over here. Okay. Call, uh, you can see 59 call and put both are add the money. Now one more thing to notice here. Okay. So. Uh, the, the other thing to notice is now when we set the 61 call because the underlying is at 59 we set the 69 61 call is out of the money okay what about the 61 put is it out of the money no, no. what is it in the money. it's in the money because 61 put is different because now it gives you the right to sell at 61 so if I now immediately buy this uh, 61 put at 746 okay and I uh, immediately exercise the put therefore I sell the underlying at 61 and I can buy back at 5860 or 5870 or whatever at 59 which we have been rounding up to 59 so now I can pocket a need profit by exercising the 61 put immediately so the 61 put has a positive intrinsic value okay so therefore you can see immediately that the price is higher than that of the call okay there are uh, basically you can see clearly that the extra price essentially reflects the extra intrinsic value of the put the fact that the call is out of the money but the put is actually in the money so the put is the opposite of the call and vice versa right is this clear because the put gives you the right to sell so you would have, you would be happy to sell at 61 when the market is at 58 60 right so you do that you can pocket some neat profit so therefore this reflects both it reflects the time value and the uh, intrinsic value both is this clear okay now one more thing you'll notice when you mouse over this you'll notice that this 34.445 percent and it is 33.9 percent let's say and 34.5 let's say and 33 can you see that percentage figure yes. okay whenever you mouse over you'll see this is 34.49 34.5 33.9 you see this is similar 33.9 33.9 34.5 34.5 okay these are what is called this is the implied volatility okay so we'll deal with this later but there's another important form uh, expression that you need to get familiar with that is called implied volatility implied you understand in mathematics we write this expression saying this implies we write it like this right implies okay in that sense implied that is past tense okay so we use an expression called implied volatility which i will now here for uh, you know here heretofore i will refer to only as i vol i'm not going to say implied volatility all the time okay so we will have this concept of i vol okay so we'll we'll see what this is but what you should understand if you wonder when you're looking at the prices these are the eyeballs okay essentially eyeball i'll just give you a brief introduction to eyeball eyeball is nothing but the essentially it's the it's the vol input that you need to enter into your option pricing model okay it's a vol input that you need to enter into the option valuation into the option valuation model to produce a call and put option prices which are equal to the current market okay the current market suppose you are valuing this option we put in all the parameters of this option and i'm not getting a call price i'm not getting a call price of 3.3 
3.31 okay let's say we are looking only at the offers okay i'm not getting a call price of 3.31 if everything else is correct okay 180 days expiry underlying price is correct everything is correct but the market price is 3.31 but my option valuation model is showing me some other price for the call option well the answer is we have to see what is the eyeball in the market price implied by the market price so it's 34.5 so the meaning of this eyeball is well if your option your ovm option valuation model is not giving you a price output here which is equal to the market price okay if you're not getting that uh, equivalence then what you have the the wall input remember wall is one of the inputs in the model this wall is one of the inputs if you enter the wall you look at the market price display you will see in professional trading systems uh, you will see the wall display okay you check the wall from here is 34.527 if you enter 34.527 here instead of 25 then you will get if everything else is correct then you will get the same price out this price output will become this price output of 3.019 will actually become 3.31 that's what eyeball means in a in a in a nutshell you will have a more discussion uh, actually because eyeball cannot be discussed without reference to historical volatility we have to also discuss another thing called h ball which is historical volatility okay so we will discuss all that later but the point is you need to understand that this because you are seeing this right now when you open your trading systems in the night okay you'll see that as well and uh, Arthik has already started packing his bags <laughs> so he has taken over the role from uh, from garvit okay all right so the time is also up okay so we've uh, so we learned something today so please make sure now one minute one one sec so please make sure you understood these terms i'm not going to cover once again okay so intrinsic value time value out of the money at the money in the money in the money means intrinsic value is positive you'll actually make a nice profit okay is this clear to everybody and eyeball also you learn how to check for eyeball and you have a broad idea of eyeball okay okay fine please do the exercise that i told you please make sure gulati log in create ids move we have to move these uh, processes quickly i find many of you guys i find that you are not actually